And today's uh, message is entitled, The Coming of the Lord, Part 2. So if you'll turn with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For, for you yourselves are fully aware that that day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. And since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. The word of the Lord. Morning, Water Dam. Good to be back with you. I, uh, I feel good to, uh, to be back, but uh, Dan said you're still in vacation mode when he saw me, so... I, uh, I want to revoke his waiver that he signed last week. <laughs> I don't know what he signed, because I actually don't, don't worry about it. Um, between him, Scott, and Meredith, and Marge, I figure uh, this place will keep floating. And uh, with the help of the Lord, it'll be here for a long time until the Lord returns. And God's people will, will minister to one another. I know that uh, all week long we heard about different people going on. Uh, different things, and I just want to say a special thanks to uh, Kelly and her family and all those who have been seeing Maria uh, to help her through this time. Uh, I'm glad that they're looking at her lungs and keeping her, getting her going. And so if Maria is listening out there, we love you, Maria, and we hope that, uh, we hope that you're uh, getting better and feeling stronger and be back with us soon. I know that she came to VBS. She really wants to be in the ministry, she goes up to the nursing home and does a lot of things, so we thank you for that. And uh, we're thankful for the Lord. Um, I want to say thank you to Meredith, too, for all the work and the hard work that goes into VBS, the planning, and then the decorating, and then the teardown, and then, as you can hear, VBS is still here. Uh, uh, and, uh, we, you know, you may have a few items that you need to grab and, and everything like that. Um, I know that... Um, there's a lot of work that goes into Breaker Rock Beach, and we were still talking about Breaker Rock Beach because Hannah practices all those songs every day, and she puts on a DVD as she listens to it. So we're... we hope you had a great fourth with your family. We certainly did. Um, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this passage that it reminds us to encourage one another with these words, to build one another up. And so as we look at it, um, Together this morning, we ask that you would build us up in the Lord. We hope and pray for your coming. We pray, Lord, for strength for those who are weak and for the sick, we ask you to heal. We thank you, Lord, for the family of God here that ministers to one another. We pray for those to be encouraged this summer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, doctors tell some of us or tell some people that they're mourning people and there's night people. I don't know which one you are, but when you think about it, whether you're a morning person or a night person, um, we have different characteristics. Um, if you go on vacation with us, you'll find that we are morning people. At least me and my wife are. But we have some uh, people that like to sleep in. They sleep in till 7, which we think... <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. Um, Melissa and I wake up with the birds, like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning sometimes, and we're talking to each other. And we heat our coffee up sometimes. Our kids make fun of us. We drink the old coffee from the pot. If we just made it yesterday, how bad can it be if you nuke it, right? And so we get up and nuke our coffee around 5 o'clock. And you can hear that, 
that bell go off in our microwave. And so sometimes it wakes the kids up. But some of us are morning larks and some of us are night owls. And uh, the morning larks are wide awake uh, even when the, before the alarm clock goes off. They hit the floor running and they never yawn. That's not really true. I yawn. And uh, the, I don't throw cold water in my face, but some people do. The, the night owls will somewhat wake up slowly. And uh, Warren Wearsby talked about this. He said, including myself, he says, I open one eye, and then I open the other eye, and then I move. I start to move my body. I don't even get out of bed yet. So it's, it's one of those things where there's a difference. And they've done studies on people, whether they, there was an article by um, Kate Suckle, S-U-K-E-L, um, are people really morning larks or night owls? And it was published in 2019. And the study was done on 32,000 nurses that she looked at in 2018. And so there are differences. And one of the things that they said that morning people prefer to rise up with the sun and feel the most energetic early in the morning. Night owls, on the other hand, sleep later in the day, perhaps even past noon. I mean, man, I wish I could. I really wish I could stay until noon. And so um, reach their peak when the sun goes down. Those night owls, they reach their peak when the, night owl, the sun goes down. Differences between the two sleep patterns or chronotypes trans transcend an individual's preferred bedtime, says sleep researcher Daniel Kripke. The internal clocks governing our sleep and wake times affect nearly every bodily function, including body temperature, hormone production, metabolism, and brain activity. And all these fluctuate in a 24-hour cycle. The time of day when your brain isn't at its peak or is at its peak depends on your chronotype. And there's some different things that you can go look at. If you want to go look at the article, you can go grab it in your own time. But it, it talks about the differences between the night owl people and the early people, the morning larks, as they call us, uh, the chirping ones that are in the morning that you get mad before you had your caffeine uh, in the morning. But you can go look that up on your own. What I want to encourage you to do is to notice in this passage that, that Paul is pointing out the difference between night and day people, day people and night people. And when it comes to the return of the Lord, we need to be morning people. We need to be awake. We need to be alert. We need to be sober and ready for that day, for that wonderful day. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we learned as Christians that we have two events ahead of us. The one being the rapture of the church and the calling up, the snatching away of the Lord when we meet the Lord in the air. When we see the Thessalonians, they were worried about that because they were expecting the return of Christ for that rapture to happen, to deliver them, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, from the wrath to come. That's what their expectations were. And this was 20 years after Christ's death. This is around 50 AD, I think, uh, is from what I've heard. But the dates, you can go look those up as far as on your own of when Thessalonians, but it's one of the earliest epistles that's out there that the people were expecting to be delivered from the wrath to come, for the sun from heaven to come down and deliver them from the wrath to come. And his encouragement was there because they were worried about, well, what about our friends and family who pass before the Lord returns? Will they miss the rapture? That was the concern. And so Paul gives us some encouragement in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you remember from two weeks ago, it says there, but we don't want you to be uninformed in chapter 4, verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. The big thing about this passage is that it gives hope and encouragement to the church. We grieve deeply over our loved ones, but we grieve with hope. That's the difference between us and the world. And so we have hope. We grieve deeply for our loved ones, but we have hope. The church's hope is in a couple of things here as we look at it and we just remind ourselves, and the first being the return of Christ, the resurrection and the return of Christ. I should say that when I, when I talk about this because that's the next verse that he says, the reason why we have hope is that for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So you don't have to worry about your loved ones who have died. They're with the Lord. 
absent from the body, right? Present with the Lord. And they use the word sleep in this case in chapter 4 as a euphemism for death. Our cemeteries are called places of sleep. It means a sleeping place. It's a place where the body sleep, not the soul. We don't have soul sleep. Our souls return to God who gave it. Jesus said, the, when he described Lazarus, he said he's only sleeping, and his disciples didn't understand why he wanted to go back. And he says, we go to awake him. And he said, after a while, they kept asking him, well, you know, why, what's the big deal if he's asleep? And God said to them, Jesus said to them, he's dead. And so he made it very plain to them, if you remember. And I, I, I looked this verse up because I had given the second service the wrong uh, chapter and verse, but in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, the Bible says about our bodies, the dust returns to the earth, and it was the spirit that returns to God who gives it, who gave it. So that tells us what happens. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, our spirit leaves and goes and bees with the Lord as soon as we die. We open our eyes in heaven as Christians. If we die in Christ, we're with the Lord. That's where Paul says, our hope is now. We don't grieve without hope. Our moms and dads, God's going to bring with him those who are falling asleep in Christ. And only God knows who those people are. There's always a conversation going on that God has put his words out there. It says in Revelation, or Romans chapter 1, it says that we, men are without excuse, that his divine power is seen. And God has communicated to us by his spirit, by his word, and through the revelation that we see of his power in the trees and everything. It says the order of the universe is speaking all the time. Day and, day and night. Day and night, the clouds, the air, the, the, the sky pours forth speech. Day and night, God is speaking. And at the, and the return of Christ, God will bring with those who have fallen asleep with him. We have this hope in this life and the life to come. Death is not the end of the road. Death is only the bend in the road. Death is something that we do not need to fear. We have hope beyond the grave in Jesus Christ. Secondly, we have hope into the fact that the, the rapture of the church, basically. And what is the rapture of the church? In verse 16, it says Jesus, Jesus is going to return. And I wrote this out, kind of breaking down. You'll see in our, our statement number nine that um, we we have as an EFCA church that Jesus returns personally, visibly, and gloriously. And you can see it in this verse, in verse 16. That's why I think it's so powerful. If you go back in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians and look up verse 16 for your own comfort, you see, for this we declare to you, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, Jesus will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Verse 15, for we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Why? Because it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry and a command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus returns visibly. The dead in Christ will rise first. We will be caught up. We who are still alive, that verse says, we who are still alive will be caught up to meet them in the clouds to be with the Lord, it says in verse 17, forever, forever. What a powerful thing. We will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says in Paul's 1 Corinthians 15, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment of a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. John Piper writes, he said two things. The dead will be raised. That teaches continuity. In other words, we'll have memories. We'll, have, we'll see each other. We'll remember each other. And the dead in Christ will be changed. They will be made imperishable. I just read a couple things that I didn't read to you last week, it's, or a couple weeks ago. It says, it, it, when we think about continuity, that we will recognize, that they rec the resurrected Jesus did not become someone else. He remained who he was, and they recognized him when he revealed himself to them. Secondly, in John's gospel, Jesus deals with Mary, Thomas, and Peter in a very personal way, right? If you remember his conversations with them, drawing on his previous knowledge of being with them. 
and reminding them that he knows them. He remembers them. And then when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he knew he was speaking to the same Jesus that he had followed for three years. We knew John said, it is the Lord. Sometimes people have trouble believing this. And, they, and someone might say, well, what if I get creme- cremated? It's not like the Lord, it's not like God's going to go, oh, no. You shouldn't have done that. I was going to resurrect you. We're talking about resurrection. We're not talking about reconstruction. We're talking about resurrection. Our bodies will be like Jesus' resurrected body. We will have a glorified body. Our bodies will be upgrades from their original body. I'll be glad about that. We are at this point with the Thessalonians waiting for the Son of Heaven to deliver us from the wrath to come, to wait for the Son from Heaven whom He raised, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Notice the mindset of the church. They believe that Christ is going to return and that they will be delivered from the wrath to come. So that brings us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We will be with the Lord forever and We will be raptured. But then he comes and he talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the day of the Lord. And I want you to see this as we take this on. If you have your Bibles open, it's a great place to really study because there's such good material here. The the problem in chapter 4, verses 13 13 through 18, was some of the brethren were living in ignorance about death. What happens to my loved one if they die before the Lord's? When the Lord returns, what if they're already dead? Will they miss out on the rapture? So there's ignorance. That's the problem. In chapter 5, the problem is different. It says it is those who live in darkness. In chapter 4, we had ignorance, being uninformed, some of your Bibles say. In chapter 5, it's people that live in darkness. He's pointing out and comparing the differences. He says, concerning the times and seasons, brothers... You get, notice this, the pause. Now, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Another, he said that before, right? But he's writing it to them. You have no need for anything to be written to you. However, I'm writing to you. And he, he says, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So the times and seasons, I don't need to write to you about. You don't need to worry about those things because in the second coming of Christ, it's called the day of the Lord. And that is a specific phrase used to describe the day of the Lord when the wrath of God will be poured out upon man. Jesus said when it comes to days and the hours, in Matthew 24, 36, he says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So people that predict times and dates... And so we have to be careful about worrying about pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, and all of those tribulations. I'm not saying they're not important, but we shouldn't fight over them. We shouldn't divide over those things. And after all, on the way up, I'm willing to change my mind. I hope you are too. (laughs) Right? That's an old joke. Thank you for laughing for those who have heard it. But one of the things that we have to be understanding is that Paul's using the same lesson language as Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7, he says there, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That we are to trust in the Lord. And we are looking for Jesus. We're not looking for times and seasons. Not that we don't pay attention to them because we need to, but we're not to worry about those things. Secondly, there will be a false peace. Notice what he says there. They live with a false security. The people that are in darkness, he says that God's going to come like a thief in the night and that those people that are living are going to be surprised because it says they don't, They live with a false, because they believe there's just going to be peace and security, but it says it's a false peace. They're lulled to sleep by it. And so people, when it says when in verse 3 there, there will be a false peace, a sudden destruction will come. While people are saying 
there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, they will not escape. They, them, those people. Who are those people? People that are living in darkness. People that don't know Christ. The unsaved world lives with a false security, like the time of the flood, when Noah was building the ark and preaching the gospel. The people were watching him. Why are you building this boat out in the middle of nowhere? The thief implies surprise and unpreparedness of those affected by it. The woman giving birth tells of the suddenness of the suffering that will come upon them. You never, if you've ever experienced this, I remember when Melissa said, I, I think I'm going into labor. It just came out of nowhere. It didn't, you didn't have any warning. I said, ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> think I'm stupid? <laughs> I'm playing around here. When Christ has taken the church out of the world, the day of the Lord will begin a seven-year period of tribulation and suffering for the word, the world. That's a commentary. Now, I know that there's good godly people on the other side of this, okay? So that's not what we're, we're not fighting over that. This is what the day of the Lord will come to the world as a thief in the night, but it will not be for the believer. The day of the Lord will come. Now, remember, the church's expectation was for Jesus to return and deliver them from the wrath to come. That's chapter 1, verse 10. So, the mindset of the early church is that Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. We are children of the day, though. We don't live like this. They will live with a false security. They will experience sudden destruction. They will not escape. And we're talking about the people that are in the unsaved world, that are unsaved, that are in darkness. Now, he's comparing, like I said, I talked to you a little bit about day and night people. When it comes to the Lord, we need to all be day people. As Christians, we're supposed to be children of the day. And he points out the difference between the day and night people. So I was thinking of the phrase to think about, this, the, like when you say something is, is as, as plain as day and night, there's a difference um, with the way things are. We as believers in God are different than the unsaved people when it comes to this between day and night. The differences are so obvious, it's plain as day and night. Notice verse 4, you, he's talking about believers, but you are not in darkness in verse 4 for that day to surprise you like a thief. In other words, you and I are in the know about this and that we know about it ahead of time. If you knew when a thief was going to come, you'd know about it. You're not ignorant about it, he's saying. You're not in darkness. For you, in verse 5 he says, for you are not in darkness in verse 4. Secondly, you are not ignorant of it. Verse 5, you are children of the light. You are all children of the light. If you're in Christ, you're children of the light. In other words, you can see. You have wisdom. Where does it come from? It comes from the Bible. So as we look at this, you are all children of the light. We are not of the night and the darkness. When we think of this, you are children of the day. Compare that with what Paul is talking about in verse 3, right before that. He says, while people, in other words, them, they... While they are saying this, there is a peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon, come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. He's making the point that there's a difference between believers who live in the light and others, unsaved, the unsaved world, who live in darkness. And so what, what happens to the church? Well, the church, if it's taken out of the world, darkness comes. I, I got to tell you, we were at, uh, on the 4th of July, uh, I went and bought a, re, a light, 800 lumen light. My wife wanted me to get the 80,000 candle powered light. 
and we were looking it up, but they couldn't, I couldn't get one. So I had to travel all over the place because I knew I'd been on a boat at night. And when it gets dark at night and you're in a boat, you need a light. Now, picture everybody going up to the cove up there by the Wisp. If you've been to Deep Creek, it's everybody's going. Like, boats just kept coming. And it's thousands of boats going into this little section of the lake. And we're sitting there on our little boat, and we can't keep an anchor. And Melissa goes, we need a bigger anchor, Jack. I told you. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's like... We finally got caught on a log. Believe it or not, that was a good thing. Our anchor caught, our anchor held, and then we just spun around in circles. But I knew the boat was anchored because we had to keep moving away from the shoreline. So I took my blood pressure pill with me so I could take it early. And then when the thing's over, you're going home with everybody that's out on the water that night. <laughs> and one guy, there's like four foot wakes, and we're in this little boat, and, and this guy, he starts playing, take me home, country roads, to the place I belong, West Virginia. I'm thinking, I'm waiting for him to go, yahoo, you know, to wait for the people going home screaming. And then when we got down, to, I, I had that light in my hand, I'm driving, and Melissa said, Jack, slow down. I can't help you if you're, you're going to throw me out of the boat. I didn't want to lose my wife. I said, sit down, I'll handle this. <laughs> Everybody in my boat was nervous. <laughs> we're like, we're going down the lake. I followed a guy all the way down through there because I'd see the little bitty light that I could follow him. But, you know, you hear stories of people running into bridges, and I had two of them to get through. But anyways, we got home because of that light. The world relies on the light. We are the light of the world. The world relies on the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. So whether they believe it or not, the wrath of God has been revealed. It's coming. It's, they can see it. Men are without excuse. And it says when you remove the light, what happens? Darkness. When you lose the salt, corruption. The church is supposed to be looking for Jesus to come. And whether it be night or day, we are supposed to be people of the light. Unbelievers are in the dark, and their understanding is darkened. Their love, they love darkness, Jesus said in John chapter 3, 19 to 21, Ephesians 5, 11. They are controlled by the power of darkness, Ephesians 6, 12, and they are headed for eternal darkness. Now, I had a great trip, but the last day we went out to eat, and I was trying to get out of the dock, and if you've ever been there, it's choppy when it's busy. And my boat bumped another boat. Yes. And I'm like, oh. And the guy, he was so nice. He was the guy's boat that I came over. We had to exchange information. And he even held on to the ropes and helped me out. And I was after, I, I sent him my, my contact information. And when you send contact information, your picture, if it's out there, is on your contact, believe it or not. And then underneath my name or my face, with my smiling, beautiful face, you know, with a headshot, you know, it's look, I look good there, in my opinion. And I'm thinking, it says Pastor Jack. And I'm thinking, was I nice to those people? I have no idea. Was I a person of the light or was I a person of the darkness? I had to ask my wife this morning, was I nice? Was I light? Anyways, the guy was very nice. He took my information, helped me out of there. I haven't heard back so far, but he had a rental boat. I felt bad because he's going to have to tell him, you know, yeah, this guy, his boat hit me. Anyways, but the Christian is associated with the light. You are not in darkness. You and I are not supposed to be ignorant. You and I are children of the light. You and I are children of the day. And then it goes on and it finishes out. It says, we are not of the night or of the darkness, but we are Christians. We are associated with Christ. He is the light. This is why, loved ones, we attend church. We attend church. We read our Bibles so that we will not be ignorant and so that we will not be in darkness. And so there's a difference. We're supposed to be living how? In constant expectancy. That, comes, that word comes out of our statement of faith. Statement number nine. He says, stay alert. Keep awake. Don't be sleeping. Don't be caught off guard. And so 
as we think about this. Chapter 5, verse 6 says in 1 Thessalonians, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Now, he's not talking about death here. He's talking about being awake, alert. In other words, we should not get careless. Sleeping speaks of, of insensibility, of no defense, of inactivity. Spurgeon helps us with an illustration. He says, a city suffers under the plague with an official walking the streets and crying out, bring out the dead, bring out the dead. All the while, a doctor with the cure in his pocket sleeps. We should be telling people. Why should we be telling them? They, they may have no inclination of what the wrath to come is, or they may make fun of it, but the Bible says they were without excuse, and they're not ignorant of it. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to tell them about the way that they've escaped. And so we're not to be asleep. A passenger ship reels. This is Spurgeon again. Under the storm is about to crash on the rocks, bringing near certain death to hundreds of passengers. All the while, the captain sleeps. It's that kind of a picture. We're supposed to be awake. So Paul says in verse 8, we need to put on something. Be watchful, be sober, verse 7 but put on the armor of light, basically. We're light people. We're not darkness people. We're supposed to be the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, if you've been with us in talking about Thessalonians, Paul keeps bringing up that triplet, faith, hope, and love. The three great gifts he talks about in Corinthians, those gifts that we read in, in 1 Thessalonians when we talk about, or I'm sorry, in Corinthians, when they read in the weddings what love is like. Love will never perish, right? Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so we're to keep on the armor of light. We are children of light. Where do I get that armor of light? It's in Romans chapter 13. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so let us cast off the works of darkness, darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its evil desires. It's not our flesh is not alive. Our flesh is definitely alive, right? We struggle like anybody else, but we have Christ. We have the ability to call upon Christ to help us through those times. Have you ever wondered what in the world is going on? You ever thought about why this world is like it is that we live in, that you're people of the day, there's people of the night? You know, now, Isaiah 59, 14 says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered, that there was no one to intercede then on his own. His own so then his own arm brought his, him salvation. His righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He puts garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. He's talking about Christ back in Isaiah. He's talking about Christ and that the streets Truth stumbles in the public square. We see that today. And what God is, dis it says he's displeased. So what did he do in response to it? He sends Jesus Christ. And the, the garment that he's encouraging us to put on, Christ wore. And we as Christians are to wear the armor of light. Again, it's hard. You bump into somebody's boat. What do you start to do? The flesh says, well, I, was it my fault or was it your fault? Who did this? I did, right? You start defending yourself, and you're, you know that's the flesh. And you just need to say, no, here's my phone number. <laughs> Let the insurance company work it out. Now, Christ was girded with all this Christian girding, and the consistent daily walk of a Christian is very difficult. Satan is the great accuser. But believers who walk in light give Satan no opportunity to attack. The difference is plain. We are to be day people, not night people. 
We are not in darkness. We live in the light. We are to live differently, to live in constant expectation. Our destiny is also different. What is our destiny? For God has not destined us for wrath. For God has not destined us for wrath. For God has not destined us for wrath. But what has he destined us for? To obtain salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live for him. MacArthur describes this passage as a very interesting. He says, our nature is different. Our, we are children of the light. Our, our behavior is different. We're supposed to be alert and awake. And that our destiny is different. That we are not appointed for wrath. But what are we appointed for? To obtain salvation. And he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we know that you have received this. What a positive statement. What a statement of surety. What a statement towards election. That it can't be sna- you can't be snatched out of the Lord's hand. And so our destiny has been obtained by the death of Jesus Christ and that Christ took our wrath. Our wrath was poured upon him. And so we, as sinners, we, we have to be blown away by that. We should be blown away by that because I know that I'm a sinner. Everybody should know that. But God's great mercy, he has given us grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. And only by the grace of God go I. And you are not appointed for wrath if you're saved. What if you're not saved? My friend, you should be saved. You should get saved. You should cry out to the Lord for forgiveness. He will be faithful to forgive you of all sin. John John 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And Jesus' death is the sole condition that sets us apart from the night people. You understand that? The only thing that sets us apart from the night people is Christ. Not our own righteousness. It's a righteousness that has been imputed to us when we receive Jesus Christ. God declared you not guilty in the court of his judgment. He gave you righteousness. So we should not be asleep. We should reach out with the gospel to people that our destiny is different. Therefore, he says, do what? Encourage one another. Comfort one another. Build each other up. Just as you are doing. It's amazing how encouraging this statement is. Paul said the same thing at the verse of the end of chapter 4, verse 18. Therefore, encourage and comfort one another with these words. John, John Miller, Pastor John Miller said, believers have knowledge. Unbelievers have darkness. So we won't be surprised. Believers are children of the light of the day. Unbelievers are of the dark and of the night. Unbelievers face sudden destruction, then they will not escape. Believers are destined for wrath. Or I'm sorry, believers are not destined for wrath. Believers will obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard that Greg Laurie say this, that there's no in-between. People say, I'm either, I'm kind of in-between. I don't know if I'm a believer yet, and I'm kind of, I'm I'm kind of unsure. I'm I'm kind of in-between, an unbeliever and a believer. Greg Laurie says there's no betweeners. You're either under God's wrath or you're not. And the point that he's making here is that this should purify us. Everyone who thus hopes in himself purifies himself as God is pure. It should compel us. It should cleanse us. The return of Christ is knowing that there is a resurrection. And in knowing that, we remain watchful. So what if you're not a believer here today? Repent and be baptized. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. Live in the light. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your table today, we thank you for your message of hope. We ask, Lord, that you would give us a sense of
your calling upon us. We believe that Jesus personally, bodily, and gloriously will return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that the time of Christ, at a time only known to God, demands constant expectancy. And it is our blessed hope that motivates us to godly living, sacrificial service, and energetic mission. Help us, Lord, to remain watchful, to walk and put on the armor of light. And to the unbeliever here, we call upon you to repent and be baptized because we love you and that Christ loved you and that only the dead in Christ will be raised. And the hope that we have is that Christ said we will be with the Lord forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear the words of the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.